Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is the Capital Link, uh, uh, Capital Link's 15th Annual International Shipping Forum. And this is the panel on raising capital through sustainable finance. <clears throat> we have a great panel for you this afternoon. We have Mr. Yoke Gorgles, uh, the Global Head of Transportation and Logistics and Managing Director of ABM AMRO. Uh, Ms. Nina Alstron, Head of Sustainable Finance, the Investment Banking Division of DBN. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, DNB Bank uh, Markets. Uh, Ms. Kira Conti, Director of Climate Change and Sustainability Services at Ernst & Young. Mr. Yannick Anselma, uh, Chief Financial Officer of Mediterranean Shipping Company. Mr. Matt Tanari, uh, Vice President, Business Development of C-SPAN Corporation. And Daniel Mito, Head of ESG Advisory at NASDAQ. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I thought that we'd start this discussion with just a general question about um, how, how has uh, environmental, social, governmental, and sustainability standards impact your company or business? How, how is it affecting you daily? Why is this relevant? Why are we talking about it? Um, let's see. Um, Matt, would you like to start? Sure. Um, from C-SPAN or ATLAS perspective, uh, ESG has been a core tenant in the business for a long time now. I think the trend towards um, more public disclosure and reporting around ESG has impacted us. It's been part of our DNA, but now we're really focused on uh, telling the public, especially as a public company, on, on the efforts that we're making towards um, continuing to improve our commitment towards ESG. We've incorporated it as part of our website now. We're, we're publishing our first ESG report this year uh, we've got a whole slew of internal targets uh, that we will be tracking against uh, publicly shortly. We're working on a public rating. Um, we've joined a whole, a whole bunch of certifications and, and memberships um, to kind of show the commitment and the continued uh, importance of ESG within the business. Nina, I know that uh, you've done a lot of work on the capital market side with uh, sustainability bonds and have worked with Matt on that. Uh, how is it, how is it uh, uh, relevant at DMB uh, uh, markets? I think DMB sort of as a broader organization or as a bank is, is definitely impacted by ESG from, from various different perspectives. So I think they all share in common that it's very much an investor driven theme that investor preferences has shifted over time and, and simply we see from, from the bank's investors or owners that there are uh, increasing expectations on, on sort of DMB as a bank to do sustainable investment to, to have ESG criteria and considerations in our, our lending activities and especially for, for DMB markets and, and what we do on the capital market side it definitely impacts the the type of advisory we provide and, and definitely also the products we provide where of course green and, and sustainable bonds uh, are, are very clear examples of a, of a very growing market which is definitely becoming more and more important. And Yannick how, how is it uh, affecting a private company like Mediterranean Shipping? The um, responsible family company, we are led by, uh, by strong values and we see it as an opportunity. Uh, we strive to create a positive impact through our business operation, obviously on people, on society, environment. So we see it really as an opportunity for us. And Kira, how, how, um, how do you view it uh, from the accounting perspective? We see three main impacts uh, basically for our clients, uh, improved risk management across the value chain. Uh, so both upstream and downstream, uh, we see improved uh, integrated thinking uh, within companies in terms of how they create value, long-term value creation and how they share this value with their stakeholders and obviously uh, an improved access to capital. So I would say these are the main three uh, business impacts across sectors. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And you know, uh, in <clears throat> shifting to uh, back to banking uh, or the banking side, um, how do you see it? Uh, I guess more from the kind of distinguishing from uh, capital markets to banking. How how do you see these issues? Yeah, 
Yeah, obviously ESG is very important for us as a bank, for ourselves, um, but more and more in the engagement with, with our clients uh, globally in any of the sectors that we are banking, um, that uh, concerns uh, the, the reduction and the uh, energy efficiency, the energy transition, the reduction of um, greenhouse gas uh, emissions, but of course also topics like um, equality and diversity, um, labor conditions, um, but of course um, also in, in the process of us um, accepting clients or not uh, uh, in, the, in the sustainability assessment that we make of our clients uh, on a continuous basis. Um, on all sorts of, of topics um, related to ESG. And, and Dan, how, how do you see it from NASDAQ's perspective? How, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, our perspective is a little bit more aggregated just because of the nature that we are in exchange. Um, sure. I think every <clears throat> analyst's comments are spot on. I think the, the major difference from a practicality standpoint is you are essentially talking about a tidal wave of data. We all know the topics. But in terms of the various raters and the various frameworks, you're talking about hundreds, if not thousands of data points. So in terms of impact, it's, it's navigating what those various raters, their methodology, how they weight the data, and then figuring out what is most material to portfolio construction, and then figuring out, you know, at what point does the marginal benefit or the marginal cost of going through that exercise exceed the marginal benefit, right? It's very much the prioritization of the various data points along with the spectrum of reporting, right? Is this something that it's a yes or no, or do we need to quantify this and then come up with a corresponding target to, to convey within the marketplace, you know, within four or five years? So now we've had kind of a general overview. Um, I thought we might drop into uh, some specific um, questions and uh, um, being somebody who does uh, a lot of ship financing, um, I thought I'd start with you up and sort of ask, um, if, you know, from a perspective of mortgage or lease financing, um, how do you go about analyzing a, um, a particular project and whether you, <clears throat> when, when, when a ship owner approaches you with a vessel, um, uh, do you distinguish between a project that directly benefits the environment or society from a project that itself does not do so, but, but will, will benefit? Environment, the environmental society. And, and the example is an offshore wind turbine installation vessel. And this is a real example because one of my clients asked me about this and I had to say, well, I know about the Poseidon principles, but I'm actually not sure how this translates to you with your vessel trying to build an offshore wind farm. Um, so how does a bank look at uh, such a situation where you've got a vessel that's gonna build something very positive, uh, an offshore wind farm, sustainable energy source, but perhaps the vessel itself isn't, you know, maybe there's questions about its fuel use. How do you, how do you go about looking at that? And, and then that's just sort of a specific question. And then in general, when you're analyzing um, projects and potential financings and, and customers, how do you go about evaluating uh, these issues uh, with respect to the vessels? Are you focused yeah. just on the vessels or on the company, et cetera? Yeah, well, I mean, and I go, and I guess that's for for all banks um, putting their own balance sheets at work, uh, or or other balance sheets. I think um, the the assessment of a project is, of course, through a number of lenses, right? I mean, and the ESG aspects are one, the business case is another, um, the counterparty, the company, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's so many aspects to a project. Um, in this case, wind um, wind um, turbine installation vessels, of course, do do a fantastic job in uh, in the installation of renewable energy offshore. Um, the way uh, uh, that you know, so so that is uh, a, a fantastic trend we're seeing, and we want to get involved in. Um, so I guess that's that's what you mean with an indirect uh, involvement into into environmental issues. Um, 
And then second, of course, is, is the assets that you need to install this offshore. Um, how, how are they doing that? That is, I think the service industry to the offshore is, is a different thing to, to assess. Ideally, you would, uh, you would do that, of course, also in a, um, in a, in a, in a, in a very responsible way uh, with, uh, with insulation vessels that are um, the most efficient, if you like using green uh, or, or renewable energy as well. Um, I'm not sure if there are any yet. Uh, that, that, you know, the propulsion of, of ships is, of course, and the fuel used for, for ships is, is the topic of, uh, of, uh, of today um, with any company, with any subsector. Um, yeah. It, do I guess uh, just to push a little bit is it, would you would you tend to give the benefit of the doubt to a uh, uh, a offshore wind turbine installation vessel that's not got the the most up to date fuel um, because of what it's doing or I mean is it, uh, do you balance that or do you say well gee I'd love to help you but your fuel your your carbon footprint doesn't meet our standards I guess I'm just trying to see yeah is that really go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I think it's a um, it's it's a situation where we as financiers or part of the funding mix could come in to to help companies to develop assets that are doing this in a most uh, green way going forward. And if the assets are not on the water yet, then I hope they will be developed in the in the, in the coming decades. Um, these vessels obvi obviously uh, work um, out out of the shores, but it's not but it's near shore, so they can probably take in uh, renewable energy sources in the future, like ammonia, uh, synthetic methanol, um, biofuels, and uh, get um, uh, maybe the use of, of of batteries, for instance, and uh, shore power. So. Those are all sorts of things that can be developed on assets like that, which uh, on a frequent basis um, um, move from from um, from shore to uh, to the to the near shore work installing assets. So um, yeah, and that is a development I think uh, a technology development that uh, that should be encouraged and uh, also by banks like uh, like us. Yeah. And and uh, Nina and I guess Matt uh, shifting over to um, the bond market. Uh, as uh, most people probably know, C-SPAN uh, had uh, recently two successful sustainability-linked financings. I guess one was a loan and one was a bond. Um, how um, how important uh, to the uh, market is the when you're doing those bonds? Um, how important to the market is the um, companies, uh, the issuing companies of uh, carbon footprint, and and in general, what are the issues in in taking that those two types of uh, the loans and the bonds to market? What kind of ESG factors uh, are, are in play there? I'll let I'll let Nina start, and then I can. Uh, okay. Yes. No, He's already yeah. earned her fee. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, I think to start off, for example, your last question on what may vary when, when looking at this from, from a loan perspective versus a bond perspective. Sure, that's going to be interesting. Yeah, I think, I think the ESG factors themselves might not necessarily differ, but, but I think what is different in, in general between loans and bonds is perhaps the, the transparency element that in a lending relationship, even if it's with several banks, you, you sort of have a better possibility of having more of a bilateral dialogue. Whereas when you go to the bond market, you might have a very large number of investors and it's not possible to have the same sort of one-on-one -on -one type of discussions. And then hence your publicly available information becomes more important, sort of having available information on your website, on, on strategies, et cetera, that becomes um, a more important part of the overall communication in that transaction. Um, so, so I think that is probably the main element in, in, in the difference between the two. Um, but then, of course, dependent on 
if we talk about sustainability linked bonds, for example, from, from CISPAN's perspective, then you will automatically include some form of sustainability target in those transactions. So by definition, that becomes sort of an important element of the discussion with investors. And what happens, um, I guess a question just on what exactly does sustainability link uh, mean? Uh, you mentioned targets, are those contractual targets that if not achieved have detrimental outcomes or are they, are they really aspirational? What, how does that work? Well, they are targets that are integrated into the, the, the loan and agreement. This is something we have seen for quite some time on the lending side with sustainability linked loans and what compared to, for example, green, green loans, which we've obviously had for a very long time, where, where the proceeds are earmarked for specific investments with environmental benefits. Um, in, in sustainability-linked structures, there's no um, requirement of what to spend the proceeds on. It's general corporate purpose financing. Instead, the, the financial terms in the transaction is linked to certain KPIs or sustainability targets. And that could, for example, be that you have a target of reducing CO2 emissions. And, and if you do so, um, in, in a lending transaction, we typically see that the margin can go both up and down, depending on how you perform versus a, a, an annual target then for, for CO2 reduction, as an example. Uh, on the bond side, we, we might not necessarily see <clears throat> annual targeting, but there will be one target throughout the life of the bond. And if you fail to meet the target, that will have an impact on the, the coupon or the redemption price of the transaction. So it definitely has a, a very clear link between performance and the actual sort of cost of, of the financing. And Matt, yes. go ahead. Yeah, I would add from the, from the issuer side or borrower side, it's really, to Nina's point on transparency, um, it doesn't look too different than a normal issuance. So we, like I said earlier, ESG has kind of been in our DNA for, you know, a decade plus at this point, um, especially the focus on E. I think uh, lenders and investors have always asked a lot of diligence questions around these topics. Um, the recent focus has been more environmental, but on, on the S and the G, um, that's, been, that's been an area of focus in the past. I think just practically speaking, the process of issuing a loan or a bond, the difference there is if you know you're doing all this great work, it's more just pulling it all together and reporting on it and, and making it transparent. And I think just using the bond as an example, um, it's really you have to deliver three additional work products versus a normal bond. You have to de deliver an ESG framework, which is published with your bond, uh, a second party opinion, which we use Sustainalytics, and then kind of the template of your annual reporting against, uh, against your progress on your KPI. So from our perspective as a public company, we're very thoughtful around the KPI targets that we attach to our bond. Um, we've been fortunate enough to, to satisfy those targets already, so we will not have the bond penalty. Um, and then the, the second piece of information <clears throat> is uh, demand. So we have found that once you pull all this together and you increase the transparency around the initiatives for ESG, you, you do unlock demand on the capital side that's earmarked for ESG. And whether those people, those investors or banks were already looking at your bond, it, it becomes more clear with the sustainability link that, um, that that capital is able to look at that issuance. So we were pleasantly surprised and it, and it enabled us on the bond side and the bank side to upsize our both of our facilities from what we had uh, initially targeted. And is all of that upsizing from um, uh, uh, institutions or funds that are that are strictly ESG oriented, or is it is is there are other other uh, institutions and funds interested? They kind of say they see something good and they want to join. I think it's a mix. Um, mix some okay. some funds mm -hmm. that may have had a maritime angle originally can find capital on the maritime and an ESG pocket. Um, others are, are pure ESG focused. Uh, so I think it's definitely a mix and, it, and it, uh, in our conversations with our partners like Nina, we think it's, it's increasing over time and will only, uh, the demand will only increase and, and rise. 
Yeah, I mean, from a pure data standpoint, everything that Matt said, we can verify that with the data and we don't have to get into it. I think we see a lot of clients who have gone through the exercise Matt outlined and, and use it for a variety of components, whether it's an investor presentation, a conference presentation, investor marketing. Um, but if you're talking about the, the competitive landscape that is competing for capital, obviously, you know, a lot of these non-fundamental perspectives are utilized in some cases as tiebreakers or, or to justify a longer term perspective or more um, or, or greater uh, or capability within strategic execution. Yannick, how is how does this uh, uh, how do these factors uh, interplay with uh, your company being a private company? Are you are you interested in pursuing sustainability linked bonds, or is it, it just part of your regular finance you might consider? Is are these things you're 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 thinking about or doing? Oh, we are very active in that area. Obviously, we have the, the same type of financing that uh, some of our peers. We try to be innovative in that area. So obviously we have a let's so called green financing, and uh, you need also to be uh, open enough in order to uh, to propose a new way of thinking in that dynamic. So you need to also to set to set uh, new standards, and uh, and we are believing this is a, this is the future of the financing. So this is you, you have to adapt to that uh, uh, new way of thinking. Yeah, yeah, the same. You have the same kind of thoughts, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and Kira, um, uh, uh, how, um, you know, hearing uh, Matt and Nina and Dan talk about uh, basically the, the sustainability linked aspects of, of these, these uh, financial uh, instruments, bonds and loans. Um, <clears throat> and I'm hearing that they have reports uh, prepared and uh, somebody's evaluating uh, how, these, how the company's performing against the requirements of the bonds. Uh, how, how does how does your company, uh, Ernst and Young, how do you um, uh, uh, make make these evaluations or go about assessing whether the requirements have been met? Uh, what factors do you use? How is materiality a part of your analysis, et cetera? Yeah, exactly. I think it's very important to stress out here that the success of the sustainability link bond depends on the selection of the sustainability KPIs. So the materiality principle comes in here. These KPIs and targets have to be material to the sector. So for example, in the shipping sector, it's obviously decarbonization as a primary material topic, but there are also others like, for example, biodiversity impacts or health and safety impacts for the seafarers, uh, human rights. So there's a series of themes, depending on the sector, that you need to link the KPIs with in order for the bond to be actually uh, successful. So this is uh, very important. And the, the most, let's say, challenging part uh, of the performance is to link these material topics to your overall ESG strategy and to have the right me uh, monitoring mechanisms and uh, KPIs to measure your progress. So. That's also part of the disclosures in the sustainability report, obviously, but these exact same KPIs are the ones used for linking them with the success of a sustainability linked bond. And is there a standard set of KPIs that are used or is there, can, can, can Matt uh, ask Nina to, to set this, set, pick us a, a group of, of, of criteria that, that C-SPAN would like to use and then work within those or is there kind of an industry standard that they're stuck with? How does, there, how does that? It's a, this is a very hot topic uh, at the moment. Well, there have been a series of, let's say, global frameworks around uh, ESG, uh, KPIs, uh, some very known is the GRI, uh, SASB, et cetera. So these uh, frameworks have a specific taxonomy of, of either uh, environmental, social, governance type of KPIs uh, and that are, again, uh, narrowed down to the sector, so material to the sector. Uh, but now there is a very big discussion about convergence of these uh, non-financial reporting standards. This was a major topic in the World Economic Forum this January. So we are uh, working uh, across four main areas of uh, establishing a, a convergence set of this type of standards. So they're, they're more or less the same across sectors, but then if you apply the materiality principle, you can select the ones that are more relevant uh, to your impacts. Uh, so this is work in progress, let's say, but there are specific uh, standalone standards that can be used at the moment. And you have this, are these, are these relevant to, to uh, 
uh, banks in doing mortgage financing? Is this, are these these same, uh, is, they're the same, we're we talking about the same uh, criteria? Yeah. It's it's a, a imagine like a set list of of uh, of KPIs under a specific taxonomy. So different KPIs for let's say more uh, soft social issues, but again a quantifiable type of KPIs. For example, for health and safety or human rights, but again very uh, detailed list of KPIs for decarbonization. So there is a specific protocol for the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there is a TCFD, which is uh, the Financial Stability Board's uh, recommendations on how to link your uh, climate-related risks to your financial impact. So there, there are specific sets that uh, are used uh, both from borrowers and the financial institutions. Mm -hmm. so, so they kind of cross yeah, bonds yeah. and loans. They're not they're not categorized. They're, no, they're categorized mostly across sectors, let's say. So there's a generic mm -hmm. taxonomy and then a sector-based taxonomy that can be used. So for the shipping sector, there are very specific, uh, both from the, the SASB uh, standards or again, the GRI, TCFD, et cetera. And to add to that, uh, we, we have used the, uh, the um, AER or the EEOI under uh, the Poseidon principles um, a couple of times. This is, uh, of course, a trajectory that per sh shipping uh, sector or class um, should be followed in the next couple of decades. And it's a nice <clears throat> method of, um, of, of using uh, that, that system that is developing um, and uh, a good cooperation between banks and, and, and uh, shipping companies. If I could add also to that from, from sort of a sustainability linked transaction perspective, finding the, the most relevant KPIs for, for each business will of course be very business specific as Kiara mentioned. Um, but again, also that is sort of the, the first step on, on in finding these KPIs, but then also for these types of transactions, it's also very important to discuss sort of the level of ambition because the, the first criteria more or less is to have the most relevant KPIs but then you also need to ensure that there's a, an ambitious target structure. Um, and, and sort of measuring is, of course, one thing, but then also finding what is the uh, ambitious, uh, more than business as usual types of targets that should be integrated in, uh, in the finance transactions. And that might be more challenging sometimes than, than sort of finding the actual KPI. Exactly. And from our experience, this is exactly what is missing. So there are a lot of uh, shipping companies that are monitoring some KPIs, but the, the actual strategy, where we want to go, what's our commitment, when are we becoming carbon neutral, or uh, what are our plans, uh, is, is missing at the moment. So yeah, this is a big issue. I think you're, you're definitely right. So Tony, for our bond, we spent a lot of time with Nina and the Sustainalytics team going through what would be most relevant and setting the, the ambitious goal for us. And to the point on being business specific, it does really matter about your model. So we're we're a, an operator, but a leasing company. Um, so we don't, we direct the ships, you know, based on our customers, fleet plans and, and, and route plans. So we don't exactly control the speed and some of the key metrics that, that, uh, you know, dictate the emissions profile. Mm -hmm. So what we decided to go with was um, a quantum, a $200 million investment commitment for the tenor of the bond to invest in alternative fuels. So it's something within our control. We said we would invest this amount of capital into alternative fuel propulsion sources over the life of the bond. Um, so it, it does it does take a lot of thought to figure out what works for you and how ambitious you can be. But, but uh, that's something that companies need to be considering before pursuing this. And I guess um, one thing that uh, comes to my mind in this part of the, the discussion is um, the ESG dialogue is oriented toward improving um, uh, matters in these areas and uh, using financial uh, lending and, and bonds and whatnot to, to achieve those, those goals. And when you look at the shipping industry, it continues to defy consolidation. And um, uh, somebody with a, a vessel can go out and make money and grow their fleet, et cetera. So uh, just sort of thinking about, we have two very large container uh, shipping companies on the panel. 
leasing <laughs> uh, and shipping. But um, so what, if, uh, how do we think that the, the ESG uh, efforts, how do those play out with these smaller companies? Are they eventually going to not find capital and, and be driven out of the market or will they continue to be there and either play ball because they, they feel it's the right thing to do or they'll play ball because they're forced to or they just won't play ball at all and they'll, they'll say, well, we're achieving better than these companies that spend time on these issues because we don't think ultimately it leads to uh, the kind of return on investment. We, we, we think it's, we should just focus on dollars and not on ESG. So I'm sort of stepping back and asking, how does this play out in the industry? Uh, what, uh, is it just gonna be the big companies that are able to do this and will be successful and they'll go their own way. And then smaller companies will just continue to do what they're doing and maybe they're not helpful to the environment or social or government issues. So just, it's sort of a broad question. I guess you don't have to answer. <laughs> from, my, from my perspective, we hope that everyone kind of is a, of the like mind that it is important and they want to commit time and, and capital to uh, improving their, their ESG initiatives and profile. I guess um, I would somewhat punt it over to the bankers on the, on the line because a lot of the smaller ship owners are, are primarily debt financed through the banks and don't need to access the capital markets. So um, I think the capital markets will shift towards ESG quickly and, and large quantums. How the banks react, I think, will dictate some of the questions you asked around cost of capital for smaller owners. Yeah, before anybody else answers, though, the one thing I would say that I've seen is with the retreat of shipping banks, I've seen the increasing rise of private equity funds and, um, and hedge funds, et cetera. So, <clears throat> so you have this this group of, of um, entities that have lots of cash coming in, filling in the gap that's left by the retreating shipping banks. And to the extent a company doesn't want to go to the capital markets, it just wants to do debt financing. And I'm finding more and more that uh, private equity is willing to act as a lender and hold a mortgage. Um, so I don't know if that, I mean, there are, I guess, funds that are ESG oriented. Um, so maybe that'll happen. But I just want to throw that out there that there's like another source of capital that's that's actually not on our panel here. Um, uh, so uh, I just want to put that in the mix before anybody else continues. I mean, we see from the exchange perspective, I mean, working with private equity all the time, right? Getting them ready on the IPO process. Um, you know, three years ago, I would say it was on their radar and there was a focus and I'm generally but I would say private equity is as focused on ESG as the, in the public markets um, in, in many cases. Now they go about it differently, right? There's a different evaluation um, and there's a different set of data points that they probably leverage. Um, but in terms of utility and focus, I would say private equity is just as focused on ESG as the public markets. So, so that won't, so private equity won't really be a, 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 a leak in the system as it were. I think need, <laughs> no, well, <laughs> no. I mean, if anything, if if anything, private equity has become a, a pretty imp a pretty critical player um, because they have more latitude and they have in in terms of just overall patience, right? There's a learning curve that they're willing to to work with their respective porcos on. Um, you know, their struggle, just like everyone, is you know what are the data points um, that we need to focus on and how do we get that data? So building infrastructure with data reporting and transparency, but it, it's even though that's an obstacle, it's not, it's, it's not a deterrent. Um, you know, I, I think private equity for the most part has really done a great job across the board on preparing smaller companies for what to, is to expect. So if you're 100 million revenue today, what do you have to have in place at 500 million revenue and then at a billion revenue, what are the set of expectations and in the, in the, in the infrastructure you need to instill um, for any given size of a company? So it seems like we think that uh... Uh, no. this, I guess. Well, I guess we haven't completed. What, what do we think is going to happen with the smaller companies? Are they going <clears throat> to start? I, yeah. uh, go ahead. No, I think. I think. Um, I think actually, smaller companies or even new companies uh, do have a place here uh, in this uh, in this um, big transition that we will foresee in the next uh, decades. Um, you know. There has, there has never been really a shortage of capital. It comes from different places. Uh, now it's indeed private equity or 
new funds that pop up that fill the gap between uh, the traditional shipping banks and uh, the ones that have, have left out. Um, there are, by the way, also a couple of uh, banks coming back into the into the play. So, you know, um, innovative innovative ships and uh, also retrofitting uh, ships have, have that has always been um, uh, developed from also smaller new platforms that uh, that uh, that come to the market. Uh, obviously, the bigger companies have economies of scale. Um, but they also have a bigger challenge to retrofit all the ships that they have on the water. I don't want to uh, mention, uh, you know, the, the 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 risk of having stranded assets. I don't believe in that uh, for the next uh, many many years, because most of the ships are just needed to fulfill a trade uh, that we all want, right? Um, um, so there are small. Uh, initiatives, small companies that are experimenting with innovative new fuels and new designs. And that is very good because, uh, you know, they will ultimately set the standard for for greener shipping. Yeah. It, I, I guess you raise an interesting point too. Um, uh, how, how do the capital markets and, and uh, I'll call them mortgage finance banks, how, how, do, how do you view it's probably a bigger problem. I, I, I'm answering one of my questions, I guess I'm asking. It's probably a bigger problem for bonds. But one of the things in shipping is how do you fund R&D? How, how do you fund upgrades and transition to fuels? Uh, where, 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 the ship, where does the ship owner go <clears throat> to, to try and, and satisfy these emerging requirements for environmental and, and social and, and governmental, uh, governmental, I guess, is a little bit easier for them to do. Uh, they control that. But the, the environment, if they're trying to upgrade, wh where can they find money for that? Is, is there a source for that? Or is it just, just is there, anyway, is, any thoughts on that? I, I guess. Well, I guess. I guess that's, uh, that, that could be a nice uh, KPI, a nice target. Right. I, I have 100 ships and I need to retrofit them for uh, two million dollars each. So let's raise 200 million dollars in a bond or a loan or whatever form and and apply it and make sure that uh, 20, 30 percent of on the fleet that I have on the water is uh, is um, becoming more efficient. You know, if, if you if you do a, a proper retrofit of all the 50,000 ships that we have on the water, we can save so much energy. And that is, uh, I think, a topic which is uh, a bit underestimated uh, because we always look at new buildings all the time. What is the next new building? Um, uh, but, you know, the, the demand supply at the moment is getting much more imbalanced. So shipping companies will earn uh, fine. Cash flows are coming their way. So I think also that, you know, once they start to become making money, uh, more money than that will be invested also in the in the ships um, afloat. Yeah, I mean one of the biggest pitfalls we see is you know companies aren't mapping non fundamental and ESG related data to actual financial metrics, right? Whether it's margin, ROIC, cash flow, or risk, like that that cross mapping has to take place. So for smaller companies, it's more of the story of obviously where you're headed. I think a lot of companies get held up on retrospective reporting, just like this is what it is. Um, not bigger companies, definitely smaller companies. So in, in highlighting that path towards what whatever you're trying to achieve or whatever that strategic directive is, it used to be where you could provide a set of fundamentals and a strategic directive. Now there has to be non-fundamental data points that validate the anecdotal perspective that you're providing. I mean, maybe to, to answer to your question, I think, uh, for the financing for uh, this type of investment, for the technology that does exist, we, 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 we can secure easily the financing because there is a, a real wish to support uh, the shipping company in that exercise. So it's not a, an issue. Where it's an issue is on the development on potential technology. And this is where we can see a gap and we, we need more partnership between the private uh, uh, and the public, between government, companies, and this is what we need to address in, in our industry. 
And I think if I could add that that's a really important point when, when discussing research, development, technological improvements, because obviously today we, we don't know what will be the, the future and, and solutions, what would be the perfect few uh, in, in 10, 20, 30 years time. And, and we definitely, I mean, we need to investigate to, to find that out. And that that's not specific for, for the shipping industry. That's of course across sectors that it's very important to, to also finance the types of technological improvements that will make it possible to, to also reach environmental and other sustainability targets going forward. So that's definitely a very important role of the financial industry as, as a whole, also to, to have the competence internally to evaluate what types of, uh, of investments should we really focus on going forward. And I think it's important to keep in mind that these initiatives they are and they, they need to continue to be economic, right? And make sense. So we can't, to Nina's point, we can't let perfect get in the way of good. So you have to be continually investing to improve incrementally until there is a very clear long-term solution. So for example, we've done a, a ton of retrofits on our existing fleet and they they make the vessels more attractive. They, they help folks like Yannick spend less on fuel and and gives them a higher kind of value in the market. So we do see a benefit from doing that today. So it's not, it's not just donated capital to, to make these investments. It actually does make sense. And, and we look forward to continue doing that. And, and maybe, maybe to add one point uh, to, to how, how to finance this, um, there's of course also a big uh, push and a liability with the cargo owners, right? They are, uh, increasingly uh, in need of uh, more efficient and greener ships. So there will be longer and higher charter rates uh, uh, projects out there. And on the back of that, they can be financed um, by, by in, in several ways. So. Um, anybody else on that? We've received a question, so I was just going to ask the panel. <clears throat> unless somebody has something they'd like to add to that. Um, so the question is, uh, almost uh, every discussion on retrofitting assumes a seamless integration of technology, which isn't true. Uh, and the examples are given of, uh, it's a usage of a VLSFO, which does not mean anything to me, uh, that leads to enhanced wear down and then scrubbers, which create operational inef inefficiencies and difficulties. And the question is, how do financial institutions on the panel view this issue? So it's basically asking, you 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 have an improvement, but then it leads to problems. What what's the bank's view? And I guess you can look at this from mortgage financing or from uh, uh, or, or capital markets. And can the panel see that? I'm sorry to ask uh, that question. Can you see that Q and A, everybody? So any, any thought on that? Nina, are you up? I think it's it's not the easiest question to, to answer. I think it's very much a case by case specific mm -hmm. discussion and that it's sort of not a, a, a one size fits all when it comes to what is actually possible, what is viable <clears throat> to, to do. Um, so I don't have a sort of a clear cut answer of how that would be viewed. I think it very much depends on, on the broader context as well. Yeah, I, I think that's probably right. I think what I think the whole point about ESG is it's got it definitely has an aspirational goal to it. And um, it can't be achieved all at once. And it's just basically providing carrots to improve things. And if we don't use carrots in the shipping industry, we're going to get the sticks from from the government. <laughs> And I, and I guess one question, if we have a moment, my, my, uh, you know, among the questions I had for us was, what do we think about the use of ESG to basically avoid the governmental stick? Uh, do we think the shipping industry through ESG and, and similar type initiatives um, and enlightened self-interest will be able to, to come up with a way of improving its environmental footprint and uh, its social uh, aspects, uh, you know, the, the treatment of seafarers, et cetera. Are they going to be able to do that? Or do we think ultimately it'll go to government regulations? That might be a little bit beyond this, this panel's uh, uh, experience, but it, it's a relevant issue that lurks behind everything we're doing. 
And I'm just wondering, we think does, does ES, is ESG the way forward than a way to avoid uh, government regulations that may cause more harm than good? Any thoughts on that? Uh, for us, I think ESG principle needs to be part of our DNA with or without regulation. And uh, quality companies needs to address it uh, for the long term, long term. And this is government or not in the, in the picture. I actually think regulation might be counterproductive in the sense that the great thing about ESG is that you see, and I say that, you know, respectfully of, of a rising tide, you know, the, the bell curve continually moves to the right and the standard for what expectations are each year over the last three or four years has, has gotten uh, more competitive. And so if you put regulation in there, in theory, you're maybe capping what best practices could entail. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of market forces. There's no competitive or influential force like the market. And if it is unregulated, companies will continue to, in my opinion, rise the tide. So I, I, I think, you know, the leaders will always establish best practices. You know, the, the observers will find and, and locate the benefits of those best practices. They'll copy that once everyone looks the same, best in class will start to establish a new set of expectations. They'll reap the benefits, people will observe that and then so on and so forth. Yeah, I agree. I think you see in the market, you know, it's very challenging to get governments uh, to agree on every single detail and regulation. So the, the shipping market and the finance counterparties and, and you know, the regulatory bodies are doing it on their own. Yeah. It's happening without the regulation and you know, you can't always go as fast as everyone would like, but it's a very large market. So uh, I, I- and, and no disrespect to governments, it's not like they know this stuff better than us, right? They don't know the business better than the business. So you might as well just let the business establish best practices and, and establish sort of a follow mentality. Yeah, but but the, ship, the shipping industry has been a little bit slow in reacting, right? And it is of course a hard to, uh, to change, hard to abate industry. Um, we're talking about assets that have a lifespan of 30 years at least, and you know, um, big capital investments are are needed. So I'm very happy that with a lot of initiatives, and I think it's uh, initiated by the IMO stand um, goals, yeah. IMO 2050 goals, and other that uh, that it now has a um, a big push, and um, there's there's a lot of things positive things happening. I, re I respect that. I would, I would, I would, I would come back respectfully and say, once Mr. Ubin became an activist with an Exxon, there wasn't an oil and gas company in the world that said we better get our <laughs> together, right? So that you know, for years, oil and gas, to a certain extent, had various government regulations, both good and bad. The second that there was an activist in that stock that said we want this set of criteria, everybody got in line. Um, we have one other question we've received. Um, it's to uh, Kiara and Nina. And the question is, what does the pipeline of sustainable, uh, sustainability linked financings look like? What, what, what is out there? Are, are, there, are the companies queuing up for this? Is it occasional? Uh, you know, what, what's the situation? I would say at least what, what we're experiencing is, is a very large and growing pipeline, I would say, that um, we've seen a tremendous growth in general in sustainable finance, both on the lending and, and the, the, the bond side over the past few years. And now with the sustainability linked bonds, for example, adding to what we already do on the green bond side, I don't think this is in any way replacing the green bond market, but it's adding to it and rather it, it's a and um, it's more replacing regular bonds because it provides additional transparency that investors are looking for. And what we hear from investors in these transactions is, is a pretty clear view that they appreciate this type of transparency. They appreciate these types of structures. And that is, of course, something that then um, provides many benefits for the issuers. So I definitely think that we will see a tremendous growth, especially on the sustainability link bond side uh, going forwards. Yeah, we have the same insights uh, regarding the trends that we get from our global investor survey on ESG. So this is a five year long process that we do every year. So for 2020, there was a very uh, big increase on the, let's say, structured method that investors are using 
to evaluate this type of information. So the percentage was 72% in 2020 uh, versus uh, only 32 in 2018. So we see a very, very um, a big trend. And this is also linked again to the need for material disclosures and uh, very the investors uh, are also very much focused on the on the TCFD type of disclosures for making this decision. So that's also very important. Okay, I, I think we might be out of time. Um, time is up, yes. Um, <laughs> so I thank everyone uh, for participating in the panel. I think we had a great panel. And uh, we wish everybody who's joined us a good afternoon or good evening, as the case may be. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, you. Events, uh, thank you. Thank you. Terrific panel. Thank you very much, really, to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.